Thank you so much for joining us at LifePoint Church Online. If God is using this ministry to impact your life, we would love to hear about it and encourage you to share your story at lifepoint.org forward slash story. If you'd like to partner with us financially and help expand our reach all over the world with the good news of Jesus, you can do so by clicking the Give button at the bottom of the page and selecting the option that works best for you. Or you can use our text to give option by texting the keyword life point and the amount to the number 45777. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you are encouraged by today's message. Maybe um, you're new to LifePoint or um, new to church. Um, or maybe uh, you've been coming for a while, but you haven't taken a step um, towards getting connected. And we talked about groups last week, and there's always opportunities to get connected and um, to be a part of what's happening here. But here's what I want to challenge you to. You listening? Yes. Give me one year of your life. Amen. Just, just one year, all right? Here's the deal. I believe wholeheartedly that if you'll give one year, not really to me, you'll give one year to God, and you'll fully immerse yourself into the life of this church, I believe in December your life will be better. If you'll get into a group, if you'll connect in serving, if you'll begin to be generous, if you'll begin to be engaged in bringing people with you, I'm telling you, I believe wholeheartedly at the end of the year. If your life isn't better in December, then you and I both will leave the church and go find a better one. All right? But I believe in December your life will be better. I believe you'll do that. If you'll engage just for the next year. Maybe you've never tried that. Maybe you've been coming and, and you've never moved beyond Sundays. You've never moved into to getting into a group with people that will study God's word together. You've never served. You, just for a year. Give it a year. And I believe it will change your life um, for the better. I believe you'll have a better marriage, better family. Um, if you'll get your kids fully engaged, I believe um, you'll have kids that love Jesus. And just give it a year. All right? Give it a year. How many of you know that um, it's sometimes easier to dream a dream than it is to speak the dream? Come on, somebody. It's easier to think about it in your head. Whatever the thing is that God is putting in your heart to do, it's, it's always easier to think about it in your mind than it is actually say it, than to actually tell somebody. I think there's a couple reasons that we don't tell people our dreams. Um, one is because I think we'll feel accountable. Like, once we say it, it's real, right? Like, once it comes out of your mouth, it's like, oh, wow, I just said that to somebody. And they may come back around to you later on and go, hey, what are you doing about that thing we talked about? And you may not want to be held accountable for that. You may not want anybody going, oh, I haven't done anything. That's why you didn't tell anybody your weight loss goals this year. Because when they saw you eating that donut, you didn't want anybody going, didn't you tell me that... Right? That's why you didn't put your workout plan on, you know, that's why you didn't Facebook it, hitting the gym three times a week, you know, none of that, right? Because somebody's going to come back along. Or you may say it and you may be saying it to somebody that can help you fulfill it. And they're like, that's awesome. I can help you. Let me introduce you. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't, I don't, I just said, I don't know if I really wanted to do it. Like I was just dreaming about it, you know? And so sometimes we'll say it jokingly, right? You know, hey man, I'm thinking about starting this business. And they're like, you're what? And you're like, I'm kidding. I'm not even serious, I'm joking, but you're kind of serious, right? But you're kind of not, but you are, but you're not. But joking it allows you to get the pass on it, right? And so you, you don't put, I think another reason that we don't speak our dreams, we don't say them out loud and, and tell people this is what we feel like God is calling us to pursue is because we're honestly afraid what people will say. I think we're kind of, we're kind of nervous, like, if it's, if it's a God-sized dream on the inside of us and we actually, like, share that thing, like, what will people think? Will they think I've lost my mind? Will they think I'm crazy? Will they think, you know, that I've gone off the deep end? Like, what are people going to say to me? And so often we never say it. So before our dream ever has a chance to live, we've already killed it because we haven't spoke it. And I just today want to encourage you, and I hope... Over this series, you've been encouraged to maybe pull a dream off of the shelf that you've put away or, or maybe, maybe go after something that you've kind of told yourself was off limits or that you couldn't do. I just want to put some courage. You know the word encourage means to put courage into. I just hope to put some courage into you at every campus that you would begin to speak that thing. Like I'm not talking about speak it to your, your pet that can't respond to you. 
I, or, you know, I'm not talking about telling your kitty cat, you know, this is the dream that God has in my heart. I'm talking about someone that can converse with you and respond to you. And if you got, if you got a whisper, if it's so big and you're so nervous, all you can do is whisper it, then you just whisper that dream out. If you got to shout it, if you got to go outside and be like, I got to get this out, I'm, I'm going to do whatever you got to do, but get the dream from out of your heart, speak that thing into the atmosphere so you can begin pursuing the thing that God has for your heart has for your life. God has a destiny for you, but you need to say it. You need to speak it. You know, they just say about old preachers, like they'd speak it and spray it. They're <laughs> spitting everywhere, right? But you need to say it. But here's, I want to encourage you, but I also want to warn you that the moment you speak your dream, there are some things that are determined to kill your dream. That the moment you speak it, the moment you declare that thing that God has put in your heart to do, there are some things on assignment to kill your dream. Just ask the mother of Moses. No longer had she held the baby in her arms than Pharaoh wanted him dead. Just ask Joseph from the Old Testament. No sooner had he spoken the dream to his family and it was within days his brothers were selling him into slavery. The moment you speak the dream that God has put in your heart, there are some things that want to kill the dream. Ask Mary, the mother of Jesus. No sooner had she been given birth than they had to flee because Herod had put out a hit on every boy under the age of two just to make sure he got them all. But he was going after Jesus. Because no sooner do you speak the dream, no sooner does God give birth to the dream on the inside of you than there are some things that are on assignment to kill you. As sure as I am that God has a dream for your life, I am just as confident that there are some things that want to kill the dream in your life. But I need you to know this, is that the target of the opposition to your dream is not your dream. Are you with me? Some of you are thinking, I'm confused. He just said, as sure as he's standing there, that God has a dream for your life, he's just as confident that something is out to kill your dream. But I need you to understand that the target, the bullseye of the opposition to your dream is not your dream, it's your confidence. It's your confidence. If the enemy can go after your confidence, then he can get your dream. If the enemy of your life can go after your confidence, the confidence you have in what God spoke to you, the confidence you have in what you saw before you saw it. Come on, somebody. The confidence that you have in what God has birthed on the ends. If he can get you to lose your confidence, you will kill your dream. He doesn't have to kill your dream. He doesn't have to get you to lay your dream aside because if you will lose your confidence, then you will kill your dream. You will lay that thing on the shelf. You will begin to question yourself. You will begin to think, well, maybe that's for another time, another day. Maybe God was sending a message to somebody on the row I was on at church, but it wasn't on me. Like it missed a seat. It bounced over. Maybe it's not what I was supposed to. And here's what I believe. There are some of you here today that you're not pursuing the thing that God has for you in your life. Life because somewhere along the way you lost your confidence you lost confidence that God could do it and that God would do it and that you did hear from God so instead of pursuing the thing that God has for you you're sitting back waiting on God to do something God is waiting on you to get your confidence back to get your shoulders back to believe again that you can do it again that God does I'm just here to help somebody get your confidence back in this season to begin to dream again. Your marriage can be whole. Your finances can be healthy. Your children can know God and love God. You can start that business. You can be successful. I'm just here to help breathe some confidence back into you. Some of you have lost your confidence. And when you lose your confidence, you will kill your dream. The enemy doesn't have to. So you need to get your confidence back. Because there are things on assignment to kill your dream. Because you may not view yourself this way, but the enemy views yourself this way, that when you are dreaming, you are dangerous. 
You don't see yourself that way. If you did, you'd walk with a little more boldness. Can I tell you something? I'm not saying this cocky, but when I'm dreaming, I am dangerous to the forces of hell. Because when I'm dreaming, I'm living. And when I'm living, fully living, I'm pursuing the purposes of God for me. And when I'm pursuing the purposes of God for me on this earth, I am advancing the kingdom of God and I am pushing against the forces of darkness on the earth and I am making a difference. And the same is true for you when you're dreaming, you're dangerous. And the enemy knows if he can steal your confidence, he can get you to stop dreaming. And if he can get you to stop dreaming, you are of no effect. So I want to bring a message to you. That was the intro. <laughs> I want to bring a message to you entitled Dream Killers. And I want to show you four things because here's the deal. I don't want you to be caught off guard. Because I hopefully have been inspiring you to dream again. Hopefully been giving you some tools on, on seeing it and, and planning it and executing it. And running after everything God has for you. And if I don't warn you, then you will get in pursuit of your dream. And you will come up against an obstacle and go, well, God must not have been for me. That preacher must have lied to me. Like, God's going to make a way where there is no way. And God's going to open doors. And God will do all that. But you're going to have to fight some battles along the way. If you aren't fighting any battles, you aren't dreaming and you probably aren't living. If something isn't opposing you, then you aren't moving forward. But the moment you begin to move forward, there are some things that will oppose you and so I want you to be wise to them are you with me shout amen. amen and so we find these in the book of Nehemiah if you have a Bible you can turn there if not it'll be on the screen for you but Nehemiah was a servant of King Xerxes and he was a cupbearer for the king which basically meant that his job you wouldn't want this job his job was to um, taste everything that was given to the king to drink so if it was poison Nehemiah could die and not the king how would you like that job every day? <laughs> and so in the course of time, Nehemiah had some family members come to him from Jerusalem and they gave him a message that broke the heart of Nehemiah. Nehemiah found out that the walls of Jerusalem had been collapsed and the city was in ruins. Um, temple worship was not happening. Um, they were unprotected. They were unfortified. They were just laid bare. Anyone could come in and ravage them and... Um, and, and hurt them, and, and all kinds of horrible things were happening, and no one was doing anything about it. And the Bible says that Nehemiah wept over it. Can I tell you something? There needs to be something in your life that you're so passionate about that you would weep over it. And he wept over it, and he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord gave him a dream, gave him a vision. And it was to go back to Jerusalem and to lead the people in rebuilding the city in bringing it back to its former glory, in reinstituting worship of God, and, and to rebuild the walls, and to put the gates back in place. And, and this was the, the dream that God gave him to go do. And so Nehemiah went, and he didn't tell anybody at first. He didn't speak it at first. And he just kind of toured the area, and he got a look at how everything was, and, and what, what did they need to fix, and what was torn down, and what needed to be rebuilt. And so then the Bible says that he finally spoke it. He gathered some people together and he said, here's the, the dream that God has put in my heart. And it's to rebuild Jerusalem and, and to bring it back to its former glory. And no sooner did Nehemiah speak it than a couple of individuals wanted to kill it. Because as soon as you speak your dream, there are things on assignment to kill your dream. Be confident of that. And so in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible says this. It says, But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about this, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked? Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim to its historic right, or historic right to it. Number one, if you're taking notes, is this, is criticism. As soon as you share your dream, um, the voice of criticism will raise its ugly head and want 
to steal your confidence and kill your dream. Can I tell you something? Not everybody can handle your dream. Not everybody can handle it. Not everybody can celebrate your dream. I don't want you to, I don't want you to get discouraged. Because God's birthed this thing in your heart and, and you're believing for something and, and hopefully you're, you're, you're desiring for something in your life. And you may go share it with some people and, and you may be fired up and like, this is the thing God's doing in my heart. And you may share it with them and they may be like, oh, that's nice. And I don't want you to get discouraged, right? But, but, but also, not just because they can't celebrate it, but not everybody can handle your dream. Not, not everybody can handle it because you'll begin to share your dream of, of what God is doing in your heart and maybe what God is birthing in your heart and, and they may criticize your dream. And you may think, well, this is what God spoke to me, but somebody's criticizing me. Can I tell you, if, you don't, if you're not aware, the critics will steal your confidence and kill your dream. But here's the deal. They're only critics because you dreaming is making them uncomfortable. You believing for something greater in your life is making them realize that they don't believe for anything in their life. Here's the deal. Sanballat and Tobiah had been in Jerusalem the whole time. They could have built that wall any day of the week they wanted to. They could have went and led the people to do what. But now Nehemiah shows up from out of town and says, this isn't acceptable. This is bothering me. I'm going to rebuild this wall. I'm going to lead the people. And all of a sudden they start criticizing. Can I tell you something? When you begin to believe God for something great in your life and you begin to push against the status quo and you begin to push against it's what everybody is comfortable with. People will begin to criticize you because your activity is shining a light on their inactivity. You pursuing something for God is shining a light that they ain't pursuing anything in their life. They would rather see you fail than to see you become successful because your success means that they're not comfortable anymore. But you've got to silence the voice of criticism in your life and say, I've seen it before I see see it. God spoke something to me. God has birthed something in my heart and I'm going to run after it no matter what you say about me. I, I don't want you to be caught off guard when critics come running their mouth to you. If not, it will catch you off guard and zap your confidence. When they start saying that you don't have what it takes. I don't think you've thought through that enough. Oh, that seems a little bit radical. Radical people change the world. That seems a little excessive. You seem like you're going all in on this. Well, you can't go halfway and do anything great in life. You can't go halfway and change the world. God's raised up this church to touch a nation, to change a world. We can't have a bunch of people that go halfway. People will begin to criticize you. People will begin to criticize you based on past mistakes. Well, you've said this before. Well, it's a new day, sister. Well, you've done that before. Well, I'm telling you, his mercies are new every morning. It's a new year. It is my time. It is my season, honey. You keep running your mouth. I see it running, but I don't hear what you're saying because I've listened to the voice of God above every other. I don't have time to listen to the critics in my life. I've heard from heaven. And I've got to do what it is that God told me to do. I don't, I don't want you to get caught off guard. I don't want you to be surprised. I, I do want to, you to be inspired, but I don't want you to quit halfway in the battle because all of a sudden you face some criticism because somebody didn't agree with you, because somebody didn't celebrate you, because somebody didn't pat you on the back, because when you said it, when you posted it, you got a negative comment. I don't want that to knock you back depressed for three weeks. I need you to understand the critics will come. Nehemiah went because he was bothered by something. Can I tell you, if you're still unsure about what it is that God has for you, it's probably the thing, you're probably the solution to the thing that bothers you the most. Vision is usually birthed out of a place of aggravation. Like some of you, it, it bothers, certain things that bother you, they don't bother me at all. I care less. 
But you have a holy discomfort because you're supposed to be the solution to it. That's probably your vision. There's people around here that, 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 that certain things bother them. And so they put passion and excellence into it. And I'm like, bless you. Thank God for you. I'm glad you do that. I don't care about that at all. But you make all of us better. Because the thing that bothers you. The thing that bothered me 11 years ago is that, that I didn't feel like there was, a, there was a lot of churches, but I didn't know there was a church in this area where, where black and white could sit together and, and rich and poor and Democratic and Republican and high on the scale of education and low on the scale of education. I didn't feel like there was a place where no matter your hang-up and your habit, no matter your issues, no matter if you were drunk yesterday, you could come to church today. No matter if you were high out of your mind yesterday, you could walk up in this... I don't I don't care if you were on your first marriage or your second or your fifth or your sixth. I wanted a place where you all could come together and discover the grace of Jesus. It bothered me. And so I found out I had to be the solution to the thing that bothered me. It's why this place got started. Because your vision is birthed out of what bothers you. Nehemiah bothered him that the city, city was in desolation. But the moment he spoke the dream, critics came out to kill the dream. Can I tell you, whatever it is God has for you, critics will come out. But you've got to decide what weight you're going to give to voices in your life. It's a great lesson to learn. You've got to decide what weight you're going to give to voices in your life. Some voices in your life, let me say it this way, all voices are not equal. All voices are not equal. The voice of the critics in your life are not equal. They shouldn't get weight in your life. Some of you are like, well, I live with them. <laughs> Just look straight ahead. Don't act like that applies to you. Don't flinch. I'm not saying you can always cut out the voice of the critics. But I'm saying you can determine what weight you give to the voice of the critics in your life. I can, I'm saying you can determine what value you give to the voice of the critics in your life. Do you allow them to influence everything that you think and everything? You can weigh them out. What are you saying, Pastor, that I should just have yes people around me that encourage me all the time and say yes to me? No, I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying you can't listen to the critics. You've got to listen to your coaches. Amen. Listen to me. The difference is this. Critics, critics don't want the best for you. They aren't invested in you. They aren't believing for God's best for you. They just want to spew their opinion, usually spewed out of their hurt and their hate. Coaches love you, love God more than you, and want God's best for you. That means they're going to encourage you and fan the flame in your life, but they're also going to come alongside you and say, hey, let's... Let's talk about this area. You need some strengthening there. You need to work on this thing. But they're going to do it in grace and in truth. They're going to do it smothered with love, but they're not going to tell you just what you want to hear. You can't let the voice of the critic have a seat at the table in your life, but you need coaches at the seat, the table in your life. Are you with me? Now, some of you are thinking because you've heard this statement, which is, I'm not saying you are, I'm just saying the statement is stupid. It's not ignorant. Ignorance you can fix with education. Stupidity is broke. You can't fix that. <laughs> this statement, well, there's a little bit of truth in every criticism. Eat the meat and spit out the bones of criticism. I believe in eating the meat and spitting out the bones. That means you learn from people that are not like you. Taking criticism and saying, I can learn something in it, is like me offering you a bowl of potato soup and saying, I did put a little bit of glass in here. But the majority of it's good. You would be stupid to eat the soup just because some of it's good, but some of it could cut your throat and slice the inside of you. Some people say, well, there's a little bit of truth in every criticism because sticks and stones won't break my bones, but words will never. That is a lie from the devil. The power of life and death, James says, is in the tongue. Words can hurt you. Words can damage you. You don't have to listen to your critics. Somebody, you need to shift your thinking. You do not have to listen to your critics. You listen to your coaches who love 
love you and will speak the word of God over you and will tell you the truth, you shut off the valve of the critics in your life. If you will let me, every Sunday I'll be your coach. I'm for you. I'm for God's best for you. I will speak the truth to you in love. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became very angry and greatly incensed. And he ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of, the, of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah the Amorite, who was at his side, said, so his buddy's there, he's like, yeah, what are they rebuilding? If even a fox climbed on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Number two thing that'll come to kill your dreams is doubt. Is doubt. I'm going to move through these last three quickly. Um, I spent too much time on criticism. <laughs> doubt. Somebody must have needed that in the house, right? On criticism. <laughs> Number two is doubt. Have you ever noticed how little seeds of doubt can get in your heart from the craziest places? You can be in a conversation with someone, or you can just be like thinking about something, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's like, whoa, where did that come from? All of a sudden, you're questioning, should I really do that? Is this really what? I don't know. Should I go do, should I be a part of that? Should God, is that what God really wants? And doubt will come at you from the crazy. You could be in a conversation with someone, and they have no idea. They've said a little something, and it just, you walk away going, well, I don't know now. Sam Ballot and Tobiah, are they really going to rebuild? I wonder if that didn't plant some seeds of doubt in them. And here's the deal. Doubt will cause you to lose confidence in what God has said. And it may not stop your dream, but you'll definitely put the brakes on your dream because of doubt. It may not kill your dream completely, but you'll begin to pump the brakes. Well, I don't know. How many of you know that if you're not so sure, you ever been going down the interstate and you're not sure if that's the exit you're supposed to take and all of a sudden you keep slowing and slowing? You're like, is this the one? What's the GPS saying? Is this the one? Look it up. What's it? I got to turn now. Tell me now. Then you swerve over, right? Y'all been there, you know. <laughs> Doubt works like that in your dream. You'll be pursuing your dream, and all of a sudden, I don't know, I don't know, is this it? So you start slowing, slowing, pumping the brakes, pumping the brakes, pumping the brakes, till soon you're just crawling through life. You got a dream in there, and it's kind of frustrated because you're crawling through life, but not really sure. Can I tell you something just to set you free if I could? If you're waiting for doubt to be eliminated from your heart, to pursue all that God has for you, you will never pursue all that God has for you. I used to think that I'd have to be 100% for us to do something as a church. I've never been 100%. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if that makes you nervous or encourages you. <laughs> if I'm about 75% sure that I've heard from God, we're going for it. I don't know how many times I've stood on this platform and other ones we've had and said, here's what God's called us to do in this year, and we're going to go after this, and I'll get in the car and go, I think, babe, I'm about, I was about 70% sure, <laughs> but I really, it's enough for me to move with it. Amen. you got to get comfortable with the 25%, yeah. because if you are 100% sure, then you leave no room in your equation for God to move. It requires no faith if there's not some percentage of what you're running after that you go, I th I'm pretty sure, like, I'm moving by faith, but I'm pretty sure. you would, I, I mean, I've grown in this. I'm down to 60% now. <laughs> I had a pastor friend tell me, he said, if I get to 51, we're going. <laughs> because doubt's never going to be completely eliminated. There's always going to be something that comes up in your life questioning you and, and making you second guess and making you want to slow down in this life. But you've got to get comfortable that if whatever it is for you, I'm good with about 60% now. I think we're supposed to buy 10 acres for our Spotsy property. And we've bought it and we've paid cash because of your generosity. But that's about 60% sure. You know, we're going to launch a 
Culpus, campus in Culpeper. And it's going to do great for the glory of God. I pray. I hope. And it did. And it is. Are you with me? And we're going to keep launching campuses. And, and I'm, I'm pretty certain where the next one's going. And I'll tell you in a couple of months. I can't say I'm 100% that's the spot. But I'm enough to move. Because I've learned that if I wait for all doubt to be eliminated, that doubt is going to continually try to be the voice in my life that steals my confidence and kills the dreams. But I've got to get comfortable with a little bit of questioning, with a little bit of doubt, but continue to move forward by faith anyways. Don't let doubt kill your dreams. Steal your confidence. Don't let doubt kill your dreams and steal your confidence. Chapter 4, the next one. Y'all still with me? Verse 7, it says, But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Asherah, they got more people now, heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. I want to point out to you that as the enemy escalated the attack on Nehemiah, Nehemiah just continued to build the city. Don't stop what you're doing just because you're being attacked. You keep building. Verse 8, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Number three is intimidation. Intimidation. Overt intimidation is pretty easy to recognize, is it not? I mean, it's, it's bullying, it's, it's threats, it's physical, it's... Um, you know, it's, it's in your face. Overt intimidation is easy to detect. But covert detim- intimidation is not so easy to detect, is it? The Bible says this, that um, the fear of man is a trap or a snare, one translation says. But the fear of God leads to life. Fear of man is a trap um, and a snare, but the fear of God leads to life. The fear of man is the use of intimidation to keep you thinking small and living small. Let me say that again. The fear of man is the use of intimidation to keep you thinking small and living small. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, well, that doesn't really apply to me. I'm not afraid of any man. Well, man is used in the neutral sense, so man or woman. Let me give you some examples, though. Is there anybody in your life that um, you see their number or name pop up on your phone? (laughs) And your heart sinks, but you answer it anyway because... You don't want to deal with the drama if you don't answer it. You don't want to deal with the underhanded, passive-aggressive comments if you don't respond. Am I helping you? Is there anybody in your life that you walk on eggshells around and you manage the family on how to respond to this individual so you don't rock the boat. It's the fear of man. It's covert intimidation. I'm not saying I know their motives, although I think sometimes they know their ability to do it and their motive is impure. Sometimes they just have so much bondage in their own life, they have no idea they're living that way. But the fear of man through covert intimidation is an inability in yourself. See, you've been waiting for them to change. We're going to talk about this a little bit more in the relationship series. You've been waiting on them to change when what needs to change is in you. It's an inability. We're going to talk about this in a few weeks. I won't get too much into this. It's an inab- Let me just say this. It's an inability to set healthy boundaries in your life that says, I will not be held hostage to your baggage and your issues. I love you, but you will not hold me hostage. I will not make decisions based on your outburst or your lack of outburst. 
I will not be intimidated by your anger. I will not be intimidated by your manipulation. I will not be controlled by you. I will be controlled by God. I will know that my heart is pure before Him. I will love you in a way that is, is loving and is pleasing to God. But at the end of the day, when I go to bed, I'm going to know that I am good with God. If I'm good with God, and in my case, good with Tammy, then all is good. Are you with me? Let me get off that. Let me get off that. We'll get back into that. In the... Nehemiah chapter 6. Let me give you the last one. We'll be done. It says, When the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall. So I want you to notice that he continued to have opposition the whole time he was building back the city. It says, By the... I had rebuilt the wall and not a gate was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates. And Sanballat the Geshem sent this message. Come let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Oh Don't go to Ono. Oh no. <laughs> I appreciate you laughing. That was a horrible joke. When they say come to Ono, oh say, oh no. I keep thinking of these all day. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project. One translation says a great work and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent, this, sent me the same message. And each time, I gave them the same answer. Number four is distraction. Distractions. If criticism can't knock you off your game, if doubt can't knock you off your game, if intimidation can't knock you off your game, then the enemy will get really crafty and just use distraction. Hey, Nehemiah. Never mind, just come down for a meeting for a few minutes. It's not that big of a deal. We, we just want to talk to you. We're not going to try to fight you. We're not making fun of you. We're not mocking you anymore. We're not ridiculing you. They may even came across like they were trying to play nice now. Never mind, just, just, just a meeting. Not a big deal. Come on. Distractions. It, it just doesn't seem like that big of a deal. It just gets you off course for a moment. It just gets you off task for a moment. Just Nehemiah, just, just come down, Nehemiah, just for a minute. We just want to meet with you. We just want to talk to you for a few minutes, Nehemiah. Not that big of a deal. Hey, I, I, I'm only going to be out of church for this month. Not that, not that big of a deal. Just a little distraction. I, we're, only, we're, only, we're, only, we're not going to really attack our debt this month so we can get financial freedom. We got some other things. Not Just not this. It's only one month out of 12. Not that big of a deal. We got 11 more. Nehemiah, just come off the wall for a minute. Distractions. I, 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 I'm too busy to do a group this semester. I'll do it, I'll do it in the fall. I just, it's just a little, you know, come on. It's only a few months out of these. It's not that big of a deal. Nehemiah, just come off the wall for a minute. It's not that big of a deal, Nehemiah. I'm just going to stop dating my wife just, just for you know, just a couple of months. We're just going to use that money for something else. Just, Nehemiah, just come off. It's not that big of a deal. Come off the wall. And the enemy will use what seem like little distractions in your life to kill your dream. Because it'll be a month that you didn't do something, and that turns into two months. And then it turns into three months, and turns into four months, and, and it, it'll, it'll, it'll be just a, a little while you didn't go on a date, but then all of a sudden you don't feel connected anymore, and all of a sudden the arguments escalate, and all of a sudden the, the disconnection is even greater, and all of a sudden the intimacy is gone from your marriage. And it's like, it's just, it's, the enemy will say, it's not that big of a deal, it's just a little thing. It's just a little thing. It's not that big of a deal. It was just a friend from high school that, that reached out to you on Facebook. It was just that ex-girlfriend that reached out, that ex-boyfriend that reached out. It's not that big of a deal, Nehemiah. Just come off the wall for a minute. It's not that big of a deal. But I want to say to you, it is that big of a deal. You can't get distracted this year. You can't allow little things to, to get you off. I pray that you have the spirit of Nehemiah over you, that, that you say, I'm doing a great work. I'm doing a great work. I don't care what the work is that God has called you to in this season. I want to say to you, it's a great work. I don't care how big you think it is or how small you think it is. It is 
a great work. And you need to have a spirit in you that says, I'm doing a great work. I can't come off this wall. I can't come down off this task. I can't set aside this thing. My marriage is too important. My finances are too important. This new business is too important. My school is too important. The thing that God has called me to is too important. I'm doing a great work. I don't have time to go down and deal with your itty bitty, small thinking, small living. I don't have time to get distracted. I've got a great work to do. Anybody got a great work to do in this season? Come on, you got a great work to do. Give God one big shout. Come on, why don't you stand to your feet all across the auditorium? Lift your hands to heaven. I just want to pray a blessing over you as we wrap up this series. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that every individual in the house today has a great work to do. And I thank you that you're revealing that to them in this season. God, that this isn't just a series to kick off a year, but it is a prophetic word over their life for this coming year. That dreams are coming alive. That dreams are being dreamed again. That fresh vision is breathed into every area of their life. And I pray, God, this year that they would work their box. I pray that they'd bring their muscle and watch you bring the miracles. And God, I pray that they would be aware of every dream killer that would want to come up against them this year. And that they would find themselves often daily if needed, saying, I've got a great work to do. I can't come down off of what God has called me to do. I've got a great work. Remind them they have a great work to do. What they're doing matters. What they fight for matters. Their vision matters. That you've called them to great things. You've called them to impact the world for the sake of the gospel. So God, may we not come down off of our wall in this season, but may we do everything that you have called us to do because he who began the great work in me will complete it until the day of salvation if you receive it give God a big shout in this house